Hey, Crystal Maiden here, and in this part, we're finally going to get the Dominion Rod back to full power. I hate this! There's nobody around! There's nobody... God, like, I just don't understand why they have that stupid mechanic. There's nobody around to see me transform back into a human. And it was night at that. There aren't that many people in Castletown to scare at night. And I still scared enough people that I wasn't allowed to turn to a human. And you need to be a human to learn an attack. And this is another inconveniently placed Golden Wolf because it's placed in an area that you weren't going anyways. Like, I guess the game assumes that you're only going- they're only going to bother getting this right before the final dungeon. But why wait? Why not just get it as soon as possible? And that's why it's so inconvenient. This would be a fantastic move if it weren't for the fact that you need to be at full health to do it. I don't know why they can't just have a sword- Oh yeah, that text proves that he was actually the hero of time. Although I accepted life as a hero. And yet some people still denied it. They, they already needed Hyrule Historia to confirm that yes, he is the hero of time. Unfortunately, oh yeah, why do they fade to black for a cutscene taking place in the exact same location? Sonic Adventure 1 on the Dreamcast didn't do that. Is this supposed to be a... Well, actually, this is a real-time cutscene. Like, you use... In general, the cutscenes in this game use the real-time Link model. In fact, if you're wearing the Zoro armor during any cutscene, or the Magic armor during any cutscene, You'll, you'll see that cutscene with you wearing that armor, which can be pretty goofy looking. So yeah, this, this cutscene's in real time, so there's no reason why it shouldn't have fade to black. Why did it do that? Okay, here's the big problem. There's no flashbacks to Illy and Link as kids being nice to each other and showing a good chemistry. Literally all they do is stare at each other. And... This reminds me of the point in the game where she stole your horse. How is this heartwarming at all? They're trying to sell us this epic childhood romance story, but it doesn't work because we have no... We, we aren't shown at all that they were good friends. Show, don't tell. There's no reason they couldn't have had actual flashbacks to them as kids other than them being too lazy to make models of them as kids. And I'm sure it wouldn't have been that hard. All you'd have to do is change Colin's model a little to make him young Link. And once again, this is a cutscene that is entirely optional. Literally all this does is have the horse charm be usable. Which is stupid because you should be able to use it anyways. It's stupid. It's interesting how like there's a different item get animation. So it helps not make it uh, not make it goofy. But it's like Ilya's theme isn't interrupted when you get the item. But Midna's lament is interrupted when she's dying by the battle theme. Which really goes to show you how much they liked Ilya more. That's right, I'm going to spend the rest of this game not restoring her memory back at all. I'm actually going to complete this game without ever restoring her memory. You can do that. So yeah, the whole Ilya's memory plot, it kind of fails. And again, I don't understand why you can't just use a horse charm as soon as you get it. I mean, it has holes in it. You'd think Link would be smart enough to know that he could blow into it. I mean, he can figure out that he can blow into horse grass. He can figure out that he can howl the horse song, and that will call the horse anyways. You'd think he would be able to figure out how to use the horse charm and what it is. Not that it really matters because it's the horse, and honestly, on average, in my experience, the wolf moves faster than the horse. Because again, the horse doesn't really feel like he's getting a proper burst of speed or moving all that faster when, you, when you're dashing. So, and he runs out of stamina too, so it just doesn't feel like on average he moves very fast. This is me trying and failing to show off a glitch because, of course, I was recording at the time. I was able to show it off perfectly fine the last time I played the game, though. 
Basically, that glitch is you can transform to a wolf at the right point next to the statue, and you'll actually clip through it and be able to skip the Temple of Time. You'll also be able to skip Snow Peak Ruins, but the ball and chain is so useful against bosses and kind of mandatory for beating Zant that speedrunners will go out of their way to beat Snow Peak Ruins, even though they can skip it with that glitch. I used that glitch to skip the Temple of Time last time I played the game. Although I like the Temple of Time, so... Really, I was just doing it to save myself time. Like, I was doing a playthrough of the game upstairs from my parents where I was just completing the game as fast as possible, skipping all the cutscenes. So, skipping one dungeon was probably what allowed me to beat the game fast enough. But yeah, this is... The redeeming factor of the fact that they basically repeat the Triforce quest and have you look all over the Hyrule field for these Dominion Rod Sky Letters. You can actually have a fun puzzle with them, controlling the Dominion Rod, actually using the Dominion Rod properly rather than just using it to move the statue out of the way and that's it. That would have been really lame. I mean, the chests only contain worthless money that's worthless at that point in the game. But there's still enough of a motivational factor for you to do the puzzle anyways. This is the point in the game where, like, just like with Wind Waker, I didn't really play through this game growing up. I watched my dad play it. This was the point in the game where my dad would always quit, and I would complete the quest for him. This is the Triforce quest to me. This is basically... The only time that I ever really played through the game, aside from after he beat it. As a result, I can't really- I don't have nearly as much fondness for it as I do with the Triforce quest where you can go to every island, explore. Like, the exploration factor is excellent in Wind Waker. But, like, there are heart pieces to find all over the place. This was basically the only part of the game that I really played through growing up. And it's not really that bad at all. You can warp directly to everything, and this is basically a Triforce quest if you got Triforce shards instead of Triforce charts. If there weren't Triforce charts at all. So even then, it's still streamlined. And you don't have to worry about boring sailing. Oh yeah, this is bullshit. This is the this is the cheapest enemy placement in the game, which is why the magic armor is so good. You could just switch to the magic armor and not have to worry about getting hit. Male ants are only used for mating. You, you wouldn't really find them out of a hive. That applies to a lot of insects with a queen, so the male golden bugs are confusing, because why would you find them in the first place? That's why it's kind of weird finding the male ant in the graveyard, because you shouldn't have found it at all. Ladybugs are one of the few true beetles, meaning that they, they bleed when they're stressed. I'm not sure why that's considered a classification or how people found that out, but there you go. And with a grasshopper, which you find in the the bubblin field, the bull field, technically only male grasshoppers produce sounds. So it's kind of weird that, like, like it would have been a nice touch if only the male grasshopper made a sound, but it would have also been dickish because you would have been less likely to see it in the grass that it blends in with. So, yeah. But yeah, you use warp portals to get to a lot of these areas faster, and we can see the warp portals from pretty far away. Like, there's not much pop-in in this game. It's good draw distance. It's not like... Like, the, the draw distance is a lot better than Wind Waker. If the Shadow Beasts come from warp portals to the Twilight Realm, Aren't we taking advantage of portals stitching together the two realms, which is what Midna disapproved of the whole game? Well, I don't know if she did or not, but... Like, wasn't the whole point of this game to separate the two realms again? So that Twilight wouldn't be invading anymore? And yet, presumably, when you go into the warp portals, you're traveling through the Twilight Realm. And I guess you're traveling through a very constricted tunnel in it, because otherwise you would... You would be able to skip to Zant's palace really quickly. Like, you go through one portal, and from there you'd just be able to go to the Zant's palace. But the whole point of this game, in the first place, was you had to get the few shadows so Mindo would be able to use its power against Zant. 
and you get have to get the dungeon items as well, so you'd be able to use them against Sand. If you got to Sand's palace that early, you wouldn't be able to beat the game, so it's not really a plot hole. The postman reads people's letters. Like you can tell because of because of his dialogue. Like when he's crouching and reading letters to find out where he needs to put them. Normally, mailmen reading people's letters is illegal. But they're able to have that rule in the first place because of the whole... Like, they have the stamp system, and I guess they do some sort of automation thing. They don't need to have postmen read letters to find out who gets them. Like, here, I guess they can look past the invasion of privacy. This is such bullshit! Why do they respawn and you have to see that entire cutscene all over again? Why couldn't they just keep the statue in that hole? That's so stupid. Like, why does, like, getting in the cutscene that congratulates you for getting the sky letter is enough to respawn that statue and it respawns it to the left of where it was originally at that? So, like, they intentionally programmed a spot for it to respawn after you got the, the sky letter, completely failing to take advantage. Completely failing to understand that you might have already put it to the hole anyways. But I do really like the the idea of putting it into the hole and then having another midnight jump spot. Like that's pretty cool. And it gets you a piece of heart, which is the best reward for the sky letter puzzle. I think every sky letter puzzle should get you a piece of heart. Especially since it's not really that big of a deal because you need five instead of four. This is easily the most annoying one. Like, you have to... Like, like... I don't really have to describe it because the footage speaks for itself. There's a lot of times where you're going to end up jumping off by accident because the camera isn't really showing you where your feet are. And that's why I jumped off by accident at the first puzzle. I wasn't able to see myself. And it's kind of hard to depth perceive and tell how far you can jump. So it's easy to overshoot your target. It's pretty annoying. It doesn't help that the auto jump in Zelda works like Castlevania. As soon as you jump, you're going forwards until you hit the ground. It's not like Sonic where you can control where you are in midair and where you're going to go at any time. It's not like you can pull left or right after jumping off a ledge to go left or right. So it's pretty stiff in that regards. It works for what it is, though. But yeah, this is this is pretty annoying. Like, you have to constantly walk all the way down a narrow area. Sure, it's convenient that these platforms are designed perfectly for doing that. What's weird is that he actually has voice acting when he reads this. Why is he disappointed? I mean, something happened. Something cool happened because of him. Like, it made... I mean, you think any scientist would be really blown away at this? And this is the infamous cannon room that everyone is very... Like, like if you save and quit in the cannon room in the Wii version, you're not going to be able to get out of it. He'll, he'll become invisible, and you'll never be able to get out of the room. Can't we just have, like, him promise not to tell anybody? I mean, it's not like anyone will believe him. I mean, he is a friend of ours. Why does everyone have to be oblivious to the masquerade? I mean, he's helping a hero. Why would he not- why is she keeping this a secret from him? But yeah, the whole problem with the glitch with the cannons room is because for some reason they made a spawn point in this room. If they had respawned you after you reloaded your file outside this room, then it'd be fine. Perlo, who's actually the operator of a minigame using the, the claw shot in Castletown, 
He's actually supposed to be this game's version of Tingle. You can tell because he wears a hood and he has a blue watch. Although it's made very subtle in the sense that he doesn't wear a green hood. He doesn't wear green, he wears brown. And he looks so realistic. He doesn't really look anything like Tingle at all aside from those two minor details. So it kind of makes me wonder what the point was. I mean, he's not even, he doesn't even have the same personality. He's just, he's a arrogant, showy guy who doesn't want you to win rather than being like Tingle. He's not saying Kalu Limpa or anything, but Hyrule Historia did confirm that he was supposed to fill the same role as Tingle. Like he isn't literally a Tingle, like it was confirmed that Tingle is actually a state of being where you get punished for greed. Like you have to look like a Tingle and be called one and basically that's why Tingle thinks he needs to get money for fairies and stuff. Yeah, that is such bullshit. I mean, I guess I should have... Like, I, I completely forgot that I needed that much money to progress with the game. If I remember that, I wouldn't have spent my money on the parrot. And all that money I got from the puzzles, I would have been able to use for this. But instead, I had to go grind for money.